Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Spencer's Painting of the Week. And we are continuing now our architectural tour of the University of Michigan this week, looking at the Ross School of Business. And the portion of the school that we're actually looking at is a $145 million addition that was built onto the existing business school in 2009. And the architect on that project was Combe Penderson Fox, which is a New York City-based firm. And the resulting addition is six floors, and it forms kind of an L-shape. And the first thing that catches your eyes here is it's a very modern kind of aesthetic, um, but the, the use of glass. So this building is very, very dependent on natural lighting, which seems to be a very popular trend for modern, eco-friendly buildings. Is it's more sustainable. You don't have to use as much artificial lighting. And this, of course, also plays on this very popular theme in modern architecture of an emphasis on the natural as opposed to the artificial, in that buildings should be more organic and more in tune with nature. When this building was being designed, the appropriate building material was one of the, the bigger challenges that the architects faced, the, this question of aesthetics versus integration. How do you make the building be attractive but also fit in with the revival architecture that characterizes the majority of its neighbors? So, brick and stone, yeah, those are pretty overused for academic buildings. The adjacent law school, which is right, where is it, right here, that's gothic, so they didn't want to also make the, the business school gothic. But we still wanted, they still wanted some sort of a, a, a masonry kind of aesthetic. Like, how do you rectify this issue, this schism that exists between modern architecture, and then at the same time we want to preserve this aesthetic of kind of old world craftsmanship? So what they used in this case was a material that's actually very cost effective and very durable, which is terracotta. So the reddish upper portions of the building are, are the, the terracotta plates. So if any of you, uh, you viewers like history, when, when I think of terracotta, I always think of the massive underground buried uh, terracotta army of the, the Chinese emperor Xin Qing Huang, the first emperor of China. But as a building material, it actually First of all, it looks very similar to wood, so you get that craftsmanship kind of look that the architects were going for. And it also pairs very well with the glass, which, as we mentioned before, is extensively used for lighting purposes. And it also goes well with the, the sandstone that we see is used here as a base. And it also has a kind of modern-looking finish, so it really gets the best of both worlds, that sort of modern look, but at the same time um, is characteristic of some of the, the older styles that are reminiscent of the buildings in its surroundings. The terracotta is also very good at absorbing solar energy, so it provides excellent insulation, which of course is particularly important in a, a state that resides in the northern part of the country like Michigan. So what I'm going to do now is tell you a little bit more about how these terracotta plates are actually put together on the building in a way that's both visually appealing and also creates this uh, very functional, what we call rain screen design. So let's hear what I have to say about that. So what a rain screen is, is it allows the circulation of air through cavities or vents that are actually built. Let's see if you can see them right in here. These cavities, which are hollow spaces between the cladding here on the outside and the insulation on the inside. So what it does is it allows a circulation of air that actually eliminates the need for caulking. And of course, caulk is a big problem because it breaks down over time and then water gets into the building. And that water damage is, is ultimately what limits the longevity of a lot of buildings. So the rain screen design eliminates that need. And if any water does happen to make it, make it through into these, into these spaces here, the circulation of air is actually pretty effective at removing any of that residual condensation. So this entire, entire building consists of these terracotta plates that you see here. They're actually built into these, these metal studded wall frames right here and held into place by, by aluminum clips. The panels seem to almost be two different colors and this is more evident when it's a really sunny day out. But the reason for that is that the fluting is actually, you'll notice right here, these, this terracotta panel, the fluting is oriented to the left at an angle like that, whereas on this panel they're oriented in the opposite direction, so the angle to the right. So what it does is it reflects the light in different directions. And in doing so, it, it gives these planar surfaces a very interesting color dynamic, and it also distracts from the building's flatness which is another big problem with, with some of these kind of uh, much more modern buildings, is that they look just kind of like big boxes. All right, so we're actually going to sneak inside now, 
and this is just one of the hallways on the upper floors, which is where the faculty offices are. There aren't very many big lecture halls or auditoriums in this building. There's more of an emphasis on the small group based learning. So you can see the example of a classroom here. It's not that large. The wood paneling and the, the terracotta paneling have been carried on into the interior of the building as well. And along this hallway, you'll see these sort of small study rooms like this. Once again, the idea of promoting small group learning. Okay, so we're going to wrap up our tour now in the main lobby, or what they like to call the winter quad. And before we walk past them, those silver arches that are hanging from the ceiling, those are actually reflecting an artificial light source right there. So at night, that interior lighting reflects off those silver panels downward into the lobby area below, which increases the amount of ambient lighting. And of course, as I'm sure you saw, that the ceiling is made almost entirely out of glass, just another way that the building is increasing the amount of natural sunlight that's available during the day. All right, that's all for this week. Be sure to tune in again next week where we'll conclude our architectural tour of the University of Michigan with a look at the Biomedical Sciences Research Building and an architectural style called Blobitecture. See you then. <laughs> <laughs>